ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಮೇಡಮ್ ladies and gentlemen good morning i welcome you all for today's webinar hosted by government first grade college and pg center chintamani today's webinar is on the topic that nrf2 signaling and neutrosity neutrosuticals dietary interventions in chronic diseases so for this webinar i welcome you all firstly i would like to call shrimati veena sn for formal welcoming of this event madam i welcome you thank you thank you sir good morning all it is my immense pleasure and privilege to welcome all the dignitaries who are virtually present in the national level webinar on nrf2 signaling and nutraceuticals dietary interventions in chronic diseases which is the most appropriate topic in the current scenario organized by department of zoology in association with iqsc gfgc and pg center chintamani karnataka firstly i would like to welcome the resource person of today's webinar dr rajesh kumar t from jss medical college mysore we are pleased by the confirmation for the acceptance of our offer as a resource person for this webinar sir i welcome you on behalf of department of zoology and gfgc and pg center chintamani karnataka now i would like to welcome our beloved principal dr k sharada ma'am for her support and cooperation in all our endeavors i welcome you ma'am on behalf of our college and department of zoology ma'am now i welcome all the participants who are the actual stakeholders of the content of this webinar who are participating in different parts of our country i welcome all the participants on behalf of our college and finally i would like to welcome the organizer dr n v balasubramanyam hod department of zoology gfgc and pg center and all the teaching and non teaching staff of gfgc and pg center chintamani karnataka i will once again welcome all the participant and all of the stakeholders thank you thank you anandal thank you professor veena sn assistant professor of physics for formal welcoming the today's speaker and about this webinar now we would like we we have with us dr k sharada principal government first aid college and pg center chintamani for keynote address of the about this webinar madam i welcome you thank you good morning to one and all present in the webinar today i am uh, proud to say and i am very happy to announce that our college 
is uh, hosting this webinar today. And I am very proud to say that the staff of our college is actively engaged in doing uh, online classes to the students and uh, making videos of their interested topics and uploading in the YouTube channels for the benefit of the student community at large. And also they are making use of the technology in teaching during this lockdown period. As a, at the same time to enhance their knowledge, to enhance the knowledge of the teaching community, we are conducting the webinars, national level webinars by inviting the resource persons from different disciplines. Uh, to, as a part of it, uh, today we are conducting a national level seminar participants are all over the country are sharing their knowledge and experiences through this webinar so as a part of it today the department of zoology of our college is conducting the national level seminar on nrf2 signaling neurotransmitter dietary interventions in chronic diseases by the resource person dr rajesh kumar t i hope this uh, Webinar will be useful to all the participants who have participated in the webinar. And also, I wish all the best for the success of this webinar. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to deliver the keynote address in the webinar. Thank you. Madam, thank you on behalf of this webinar for uh, the keynote address about this event. I also thank you for your uh, constant support in, in organizing various webinars at our college. Thank you for this. Now, we have with us Dr. M. V. Balasubramanian, Head and Assistant Professor of Zoology, to introduce about today's speaker. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Very good morning and warm greeting from GFGC and PG Center, Chintamani. It's my great privilege to speak about few words on today's speaker, Dr. T. Dr. Rajesh Kumar T. received a MSc degree from Bangalore University and later pursued his PhD at CFTRI, Central Food Technological Research Institute, Mysore. He was awarded PhD degree in year 2001 from Mysore University. After his PhD, he moved to Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA for postdoctoral studies and con continued to work as faculty at Johns Hopkins University for next 14 years. In 2015, he returned to India after receiving prestigious Ramlingan, Ramlinga Swami Fellowship from Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. After returning from USA, Dr. Rajesh joined as Associate Professor at Department of Biochemistry, JSS Medical College, JSS Academy of Education and Research, Mysore. Dr. Rajesh has around 60 research publications, three patents, and have received 12 crore worth of projects from Government of India to carry out research. With this brief introduction, brief background, I cordially invite Dr. Rajesh to deliver a talk on NRF2 signaling and nutraceuticals, dietary inventory interventions in chronic disease over to Dinesh sir thank you sir thank you dr mv balasubramanian for your uh, formal welcoming about uh, today's speaker dr rajesh kumar t now i am handing over the session to the today's speaker dr rajesh kumar t sir please uh, take the next session for this webinar thank you I request uh, Rajesh Kumar sir to share the PPT and unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself sir. I am giving you the request. Yes. Uh, so you, you can share the screen. Sir. So can you hear me? Rajesh sir. Um, yeah. It says you, I cannot share the screen while other yeah, participants yeah, yeah. share. Yes, yes. Let me let me end myself. Uh, have to end okay. the screen. Stop sharing. Yes. Now you can share, sir. Uh, before that, uh, I think we can have a snap of all participants at at once. So all participants, sure. we can have a snap at once. 
please uh, switch on your videos. You have to stop uh, sharing this here. Okay. Please. Yeah. So please uh, switch on your videos, all of you. We'll have a snap. Will all of them fit? Uh, no. Yes. Let me let me check that. Yeah. So here, uh, we are there. I think uh, we got that. Uh, now you can share the. Yes, sir. Please share the screen. So, can you hear me now? I oh. can hear you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please uh, share the screen. There is some uh, small technical error that it has went to the airplane mode. Yeah. Please, please continue, sir. Share the screen. Share the screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning to all. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. So it's my pleasure to be a part of this webinar series. I really thank uh, uh, Dr. Balu, who has been my classmate during my master's. And uh, we had really good time. And those days he had much more hairs uh, than what he see him now. <laughs> so, so I met, I saw Balu like three years back after 20 years. So, so it's been uh, nice to see him. I would like to thank uh, uh, Madam Sharda for, uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar series and also the faculties who introduced me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this webinar series and uh, share my research experience and research knowledge what I've gained from past 20 years. So without much delay, I would start it. Before that, I would like to disclose that uh, there could be some internet problem. If there is any, please uh, chat, send me a message so that I can you know, uh, correct it. So, so today I have uh, chosen a topic uh, which is, uh, uh, as you can read it, it is NRF2 signaling and nutraceuticals. So I'm going to talk about a protein called NRF2 and then uh, talk about uh, nutraceuticals. Nutraceuticals is, is a very common term. People are using it wherein uh, 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 it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chemical which is a food. So it's a food, but it has a pharmacological activity. Okay, so, so, so it can be a food as well as a, a drug or a medicine for, for uh, mitigating or preventing the disease process. So, so uh, I'm going to share some uh, 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 data where we can see that by using nutraceuticals as a dietary supplements, you can prevent chronic diseases. Uh, when I say chronic diseases, though I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I focus more on cardiovascular disease as well as respiratory disease, primarily respiratory diseases. But this approach, what I'm going to talk to you, is uh, widely applicable to every diseases. As you can see, as maybe you can realize from, from by the end of my talk, this uh, signaling pathway is so important in determining susceptibility as well as resistance to diseases. Okay. So, so this is the overview of my uh, talk. Uh, before I go again, let me confirm whether you guys are able to hear me. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You Without can hear. Me? Yes, sir. Well, there is one small uh, request. Uh, that annotations uh, that, that you are using, that lines which are coming yeah. on the screen. Lines which are I coming think, uh, on the screen. When I use my screen, it's coming up. So I'm, I'm going to avoid that using now. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. When I move my cursor, it is showing some kind of lines. But I'm going to avoid it now. Thank you. So, uh, so this is an overview. And uh, as you can see, uh, it, it has uh, uh, basic biology, then you have experimental models, then you have clinical studies, and then finally we'll end up coming together. So, so my aim for this uh, uh, talk today would be 
uh, not only to convey my research, what I have done it, also to take you the journey how a lab discovery, a discovery made in the lab, is then directed towards uh, drug development, then clinical testing of that drug, and then it goes to community. So I was fortunate to, to, uh, you know, to experience this journey in the last 20 years when I joined Johns Hopkins uh, and, and uh, take my discovery from the lab to the bedside and finally to the community. I'm going to share more uh, information related to the basic biology and then experimental models and more into nutraceuticals which can be used in the community. Less on the clinical part, but you will get uh, how, no, how much uh, uh, you know, uh, time, money, knowledge is required to, to translate a basic research finding from the lab to the clinic and to the community, okay? Before I go into details, let me uh, define a few terminologies so that it will be easy for the students to understand. Uh, oxidative stress, which I think most of you are familiar, oxidative stress is a condition wherein you have a increased production and accumulation of free radicals. What are free radicals? You all know free radicals are, are a very reactive species. They are the uh, molecules with uh, unpaired electrons, so they're very reactive. So they would uh, immediately react with any, any, uh, any macro other molecule which is present next to it. And uh, free radicals could be reactive oxygen species. That means they are derived from oxygen, oxygen, or it could be a reactive nitrogen species wherein the radical is on the nitrogen atom. And so it's a condition where you have increased production. At the same time, you have very low levels of antioxidants. What are antioxidants? These are the molecules, or you can say uh, biomolecules, which help to detoxify, neutralize, or stop the free radical production. So oxidative stress is, is an imbalance of free radicals and antioxidants in favor of more of free radicals. Okay, so, so free radical is bad. At very low level, they are good, but excess is bad. So oxidative stress is, is in a layman language, we refer that it has a state where you have more free radical production, more free radical accumulation. And if you, if you remember your biochemistry, oxidative stress is involved in every disease what we experience, every disease, okay? So oxidative stress is a trigger, is the initiator of a disease, and also amplifies the disease as it progresses. The other term which I'm going to very commonly use is word inflammation, which you all are very familiar, okay? Which inflammation basically refers to body's immune response to harmful stimuli. This harmful stimuli could be an infection, it could be a microbial infection, that it could be a bacteria, it could be a virus, it could be a fungus, or it could be a chemical toxin, which you are getting exposed. It could be a cigarette smoke, it could be air pollutant, it could be a pesticide, or even a tissue injury. For instance, if you cut your skin or cut your finger, the body responds to it. So that is also called inflammation. So inflammation, primarily fights against the harmful irritant, okay? What happens during inflammation? In response to irritant, which could be infection, toxin, or injury, the cells at that site of infection or the site of injury, they produce signaling molecules. What are the signaling molecules? They are chemokines, cytokines, prostaglandins, and leukotrans. So these are signaling molecules. They are responsible for pain, fever, increased blood flow, like for, and redness of your skin. For instance, if you have a, uh, uh, if you are stung by a bee or an ant, you see a redness around that, right? So that redness is caused by increased blood flow. And, and who mediates that? So these are the chemokines, cytokines, prostaglandins, leukotrans. These are the ones which mediates that. So by increasing the blood flow to that particular area, you're increasing the recruitment of WBCs, white blood cells. And there are different kinds of white blood cells. You are familiar, that is macrophages, neutrophils, and lymphocytes. So the, the function of these macrophages, neutrophils, or lymphocytes is to fight against the insult, which could be a germ. So it basically goes and kills the germ. How do they kill? They produce free radicals. The same free radicals which are produced here, 
they are these cells produce free radicals so they are endogenous source of free radicals these free radicals they basically kill the germs they also secrete proteases these are the enzymes which can degrade proteins right so they also secrete a lot of proteases then also secrete cytotoxins that means they'll have toxins that will make pore in the germs or pore in the cells which are infected with the germs and that kills it so this is a normal physiological process how we defend against the germs only problem is when this inflammation happens it does not differentiate between the germ and the self that means irrespective of whether your cell or germ it's going to do the damage the idea is to kill the germ but the prob problem is the collateral damage is the self so if you have excess of inflammation that will cause tissue destruction and that tissue destruction will lead to disease this is exactly like a good analogy would be if there is a war between two countries during the war either both the countries will will have in, will get infected with uh, damage damage could be civil properties like buildings will be getting destroyed uh, in roads everything will get destroyed right but the goal is to kill or rather to defeat your enemy but in the process you have all this collateral damage so same way there is a war between the germs and your body and that war is fought by these inflammatory cells which are macrophages neutrophils and they produce these arsenals weapons to kill the germs but in the process you will kill your tissue also so excess of inflammation prolonged inflammation is a cause for the disease so if you can prevent oxidative stress you can prevent inflammation you can prevent the disease course so next term resolution and tissue repair so after the inflammation after the fight now you want to repair you want to heal the tissue right for example you if you have a cut after one or two days you'll see it's healing process happening right so that is what we call resolution of inflammation wherein the inflammation is now mitigated it's halted and now the tissue repair starts wherein the epithelial cells will start dividing and heal the whole process however if 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 the if the healing process is not proper if it is poor healing the wound will last for long or if there is excess of healing that means dysregulated healing we call that is called as fibrosis wherein you have hardening of the tissues okay if you if you can see when a kid uh, gets any injury uh, or he, he, he gets a cut you see that the mark is disappears with time but the same cut is made in a in an older adult or an older citizen you see that there's mark remains for longer time you see a mark that mark is mainly because of fibrosis process and if this fibrosis happens in your organ say for example in a lung or in a kidney that will block or that will cause aberrant function of the organ and that will cause the disease so that's a major cause for for cardiac failure lung failure kidney failure where you have a poor repair or a dysregulated repair the next term which i'm going to use is the adaptive stress response and you all know what is adaptation we often use this word very loosely saying oh you have to adapt to a situation because if you don't adapt to a situation you're going to you're going to perish you're going to fail right the same way when the cell experiences uh, uh, any any exposure to any toxicants the cell has to defend itself and it defends by mounting a stress response and this is called as adaptive stress response okay basically the cell will start producing certain things which will help to fight against the germ or the threat whatever it's getting in so so adaptive stress response is another keyword which i would like you to remember then one more uh, uh, terminology is transcription factor which most of you know it's basically a protein that regulates transcription of genes to mrna okay by binding to a specific dna sequence uh, i'm sorry if i am going overboard with some some uh, scientific terminologies to non uh, life science uh, uh, students and faculties but uh, you can think of like a transcription factor like a, 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 it's like a person uh, it, uh, so there is a switch uh, uh, present in front of the genes the switch has to be switched on to gene to be decoded into a mrna and this mrna becomes proteins and the proteins are the one which execute all the function the switch is regulated by transcription factor only when this protein goes and binds to that switch it switches on and you have expression so transcription factor are protein that regulates many genes at a time and these genes are not irrelevant if genes are very relevant to a particular task if it is a protection against germs only those genes will be upregulated so you have different transcription factors regulated to different sets of genes if you have a 
term, you have a one particular transcription factor getting upregulated. If you are exposed to UV radiation that causes oxygen cells, you have a different transcription factor coming up. So, so transcription factors are proteins that regulate many genes. So, so these are the terms I would like you to remember, uh, particularly oxidative stress, inflammation, and transcription factor. Okay. Now, coming to the crunch of my talk, every day we get exposed to environmental stressors or toxicants, which could be uh, pollution, which could be a smoke, which could be hazardous chemicals, which could be pesticides, ionizing radiations, or dietary related toxicants, which could be carcinogens, it could be high salt, it could be glucose, high starch, all that. And then it also could be methylenes. So when you are constantly insulting your body with these toxicants or these stressors, that leads to chronic diseases. Okay, chronic diseases could be hypertension, it could be asthma, it could be COPD, it could be neurological disease, it could be Alzheimer's disease, it could be Parkinson's, you name a disease, this is, we know the etiological factor that causes the disease. We know the causal factor. Okay, so, uh, so this disease does not happen overnight. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a full-blown disease. That means you're insulting your body with that stressor for a long period of time. Imagine if you're a smoker. A smoker gets COPD or heart attack after he smokes for nearly 10 to 15 years. Okay? So similarly, in diabetic also, you are insulting your body with some high-calorie diet for a long period of time that one fine day you develop insulin resistance. So, it's, so, so, so you, you, you have a window of 10 to 15 years to, to prevent the disease or mitigate the disease. Okay, so we're going to talk about how it happens. And you must be familiar that over 50% of the world population, you're talking about more than 3.5 billion people are suffering from chronic diseases. Okay, so how does a disease happen, right? In a very simple layman, layman language, <clears throat> when you get exposed to environmental stresses, you are... Uh, uh, these stresses will increase oxidative stress. You remember the oxidative stress terminology which I defined it. Basically, they will produce more of reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species. These free radicals, they can damage your macromolecules, which could be lipids, which could be proteins, which could be DNA. If it is damaging your lipids, you know, the membrane is made up of lipids. So there is a membrane damage. That means there are pores are formed. So when the membrane integrity is lost, the cell cannot survive, the cell is abnormal. In the same way, a protein get oxidized. When it gets oxidized, it loses its function. And if it is an enzyme, if it loses its function, you know the consequence of that, what will happen, right? If that enzyme is very important for a, for a particular reaction, because enzymes are catalyst, if that catalyst is not there, that means that reaction would not happen, and the product may be important for the normal physiology. So that way, you will have a problem with that, right? Or you may have a DNA strand breaks or mutation, and you know what will happen if it, if, the, if it is a mutation on a critical oncogene, it leads to cancer, right? So all this damage to these macromolecules can lead to a defective cell, or it can lead to cell death. When there is a cell death or defective cell, your body senses that and induces inflammation. Again, inflammation means you are recruiting the, your WBCs to the site of injury, and this inflammation can sustain or can it can increase the tissue injury where they are placed and this continuous tissue injury like for example you take a smoker lung the smoker a smoker can smoke a pack or two pack per day that means you're talking about 20 to 40 cigarettes per but it will cause tissue injury and tissue injury leads to organ failure and that means you have an onset of the disease and the disease progresses. So this is how it happens. So your health depends on how well we defend stress or toxicant. Let me repeat, read this again. Health, your health will depend on how well we defend against environmental stresses or toxicants. So it's not one day, it's a continuous process. Okay, so, uh, uh, so you, you might have heard, uh, we often, you know, we, we, we talk, okay, hey, you eat this uh, vegetable, it will improve your immunity. Basically, what we mean is, it will improve your defense mechanism against 
the stress cell. The stress cell could be a germ or it could be toxic. So, so diet can modulate your health by modulating the defense mechanism against the stressor and obstacles. That's why I tell you, your health depends on how well we defend against it. Like for instance, in a room, if I, if I release a, 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 a virus, you will see only 10% people showing symptoms. Other 90% are fine. They don't show any symptoms. Why? Because they have certain defense mechanism that is protecting them. The same way, you know, you talk about COVID-19, like coronavirus, which is happening. 80% are asymptomatic. That means you're not showing any symptoms. What did we conclude? Probably these 80% people are resistant to any symptoms. Basically, they're able to kill the virus much better than the other 20% people. So, so your health, again, to it defend, it depends on how well you fight against the stressors. Okay? So now, how do cells sense the stressor? It could be a germ, it could be toxic, and how do they do that? So very integrated process. So cells have receptors on their membrane. They can sense that. Or... These stressors can induce redox changes. That means they can induce reactive oxygen species or ROS species generation. It can cause damage to the macromolecules, which could be lipid, protein. Okay. Once the damage happens, in your cells, there are sensors which sense this damage or they sense the redox potential. These sensors convey the message and activate a stress response signaling. It's exactly like how how we had prepared for COVID fight. There was a central team which was you know, uh, directing the, the police, the doctors, the ASHA workers to do and initiate the response. The same way here, whenever you have a stressor, your cells activate a stress response signaling. And once the signaling is activated, it, it activates a, a, a set of transcription factors. Remember, the transcription factor is a protein which regulates multiple genes. So there are a handful of transcription factors which we call them as stress response factors. Okay? And what do they do? They activate adaptive stress response transcription program. That means they will one, each of them will, will induce a specific set of genes that will defend against the stressor. Okay? So we call this adaptation to that. Okay, and now what does that include? It includes the different pathways. It can include, for example, if you're exposed to air pollutant, it'll, uh, it'll increase, uh, your cells will increase detoxification enzymes. If you're exposed to UV light, for example, uh, some people have sunburns. So when they go out, the only way you can protect from sunburn is that your skin cells increase antioxidant defenses. Okay, so if you have less of antioxidants, that means you'll have more of cell injury. The same way, it includes macromolecular damage. So there are different pathways which are activated depending upon the stress and depending upon the injury that stress causes. If this stress response is inadequate, if it is adequate, you restore the normal homeostasis. You expose the cell to UV radiation after one hour or two hours. Now it is fine. It, it can resist whatever uh, UV uh, stress is causing it. But if the stress is inadequate because one of these transcript factors is not upregulated, or this stress signaling mechanism is failed, or probably these receptors are not functioning, either way, there will be an inadequate stress response. So it will be inadequate adaptive response. That means your cell is not ready to defend against that. In that case, the cell will accumulate injury or damage and that causes diseases. I hope I'm clear, right? I'm, I'm trying to give some background so that you can, you can appreciate what I'm going to show in the next few slides. Now, there are many transcription factors. Today's, I'm going to talk about is NRF2, okay? And this is, uh, uh, this was discovered in uh, late 90s, 98, 97, but the actual function of it started uh, coming out. Uh, and, I mean, the evidence uh, related to that was started coming in 2000, 2001. And that's the when, when I joined uh, Johns Hopkins after my PhD. And when this was, this was discovered, we hardly knew the function of it. So, uh, so my, f my first project was to discover the role of this particular task factors. And over a period of 20 years, we know a lot about this one. So I'm going to put you in one slide what all it does it. So it's a transcription factor, like I told, and the name, uh, sorry, 
uh, it's called as nuclear factor erythroid 2 related factor 2. In short form, we call this NRF2 or NERF2 we call. So this protein, NERF2, is in the cytoplasm of the cell. And it is held by two molecules of another protein called KEEP1. So KEEP1 is a repressor of NRF2. That means it's holding it back. It does not allow it to be free and do its function. So all this is happening in the cytoplasm. It's like you know your friend is holding you and not allowing you to do a function. And constantly in a normal cell, this complex is getting degraded because there is no function of that in a normal cell. So it's constantly very it, it constantly get degraded, and a very small amount of protein will be there in this in the in the cell. However, when you cell get exposed to stresses, which could be any stress, which could be smoke, pathogen, carcinogen, air pollutant, radiation, it disrupts this bounding between these two proteins. The repressor, the keep on repressor is now unable to bound to keep NRF2 because the, the, these electrophiles and reactive species, they modify this protein. As a result, it can no more bound to this protein NRF2. And NRF2 is now free in the cytoplasm. And now it migrates into nucleus. Remember, this transcription factor function is, is in, the, in the nucleus, not in the cytoplasm. But then this key point is a sensor of the damage. Once it senses the damage, which is the ROS, it releases NRF2. And now it migrates to nucleus. And it binds to DNA. And it binds to genes which have specific DNA sequence we call as antioxidant response. This is the sequence which is in. In all the genes which have this sequence, only those genes will be switched on. Please pay attention to this part. It will bind to only those genes which have this sequence in the promoter. Not every, uh, not all genes, only genes. And by, by sequencing and by microarray technologies, we could see that it can, this, this sequence is there in almost 3,000 genes. And when an to bind to this, uh, element it can upregulate at a time almost 3000 genes okay in your in your cell how many cell how many genes are there how many functions are there? there are 20000 genes so nr2 regulates almost 2 to 3% of the genes and what do the genes do the genes can be classified into different functions they regulate all the antioxidant enzymes these are the enzymes which will detoxify your free radicals they regulate proteins which are important for detoxifying your air pollutants, your diesel exhaust particles, your xenobiotics, your pesticides. So they, once they get upregulated, the enzymes will go and detoxify so that it will not cause, that particular chemical will not cause injury to that. It, it helps in synthesizing NADPH. NADPH is a very good, very important biomolecule which, has, which act as a cofactor and helps to function of these enzymes. So all together, what do they do? They diminish oxidative stress, diminish inflammation. They, they block the signaling pathway that increases inflammation. At the same time, they improve antimicrobial responses. So when you diminish inflammation, when you diminish oxidative stress, that means there'll be less of tissue injury, right? Along with that, they also regulate this particular system called proteasal system. Means and have to regulate uh, uh, certain proteins that will help to recognize the damaged proteins and destroy it. Every now and then, your cell, so there is a finite life of any protein. After 48 hours or 72 hours, they are destroyed. So that new protein comes in. But when you get exposed to a stressor, the protein are more frequently damaged. And your, this NR2 pathway upregulates a set of genes, and those genes will be coded translated to protein and these proteins will help to degrade the damaged proteins because damaged protein accumulation in the cell is toxic that is a common or pathogenic driver for alzheimer and parkinson disease you have damaged proteins accumulated over time so they maintain a cellular proteostasis if you have more damaged protein we call proteotoxic stress and this pathway will act this protein particular nrf2 will activate a set of genes will in, that will help to remove these damaged proteins it also regulates certain other genes i'm just going to highlight that one is cd36 and marco so so i told you that uh, after inflammation you have resolution of inflammation that means after a war you have so much of destruction there has to be some guy to go clean up the debris right if you don't remove all that 
uh, shambles of the building, you cannot rebuild the uh, new, new, uh, new building or new city. The same way, when there is a tissue destruction, you'll have a lot of debris. Your macrophages are the one which help to eat that debris and clean up that. So they are called as scavengers. The macrophages, they basically recognize this debris by this receptor called CD36 and Marco. So NRF2 will increase the expression of these, these receptors on the cell of the macrophages and help in removing this debris. That means clearing of the damage. It also regulates metabolism. It also regulates a pathway called NOT signaling, which helps to tissue regeneration. Okay, so overall, it helps in regulating innate immunity. It helps in resolution tissue repair as well as tissue regeneration. And if you, these are the key ingredient to protect from disease. If one of this pathway or one of this uh, you know, uh, system is not well, if it is not controlled well, it leads to disease. So by upregulating this NRF2, or we can say activating this NRF2, we increase all these protective mechanisms in your cell, which helps to reduce this you know, damage and helps to protect from disease. Okay. So now, what happens in disease condition? In disease condition, because we are insulting or we are getting exposed to a stressor for a long over a period of 10 years, this pathway is compromised. Okay, that means the NR2 activation or NR2 signaling is diminished. And that may be the cause for the disease appearance also. To avoid that, or now what we do, if, if it is going down, how, how can we you know, rectify that? You can develop drugs which now we're going to prevent the keep on binding to NRF2 and then the NRF will be activated. The problem with the, with this, uh, uh, with the defective cell was it's, it was unable to activate NRF2 or the NRF2 activation was not sufficient. Now you can develop small molecules or a drug which can now disrupt this interaction. And now by disrupting this interaction, you can increase all these defensive protective mechanisms and prevent the disease. So that's the whole paradigm that I'm going to present you. Okay, so this is what we discovered during early or maybe late 2000. So all this, I'm, I'm, I have compiled the whole evidence what I, uh, we have you know, uh, generated over a period of 10, 15 years. Like if we started from 2002 until 2011, we were able to, this is only, this data what I'm showing is only from, uh, not only from our lab, uh, from other groups also, okay. so. Overall, if you upregulate an RF2, you can protect from disease. That's what I want to convey it. Now, what are the different antioxidants that an RF2 regulates? You, all, you see this, all the circles, all these are genes which are antioxidant genes. So these genes can become protein, rather they become protein, and these proteins can directly inactivate your ROS, reactive host species. They can directly detoxify your electrophiles, which are the uh, which are the uh, chemicals which you inhale or, uh, or get it through diet. If you don't detoxify them, they can damage your cell and cause cancer or diseases. So they help to detoxify these ultrophiles. They can neutralize peroxides. Basically, these are the byproducts of lipid peroxidation. They can neutralize these uh, peroxides, which are very toxic. And, and that way, it can protect the damage happening. Now, to, to uh, measure whether NRF2 is getting activated or not, what we do is we measure the expression of these genes. So we call them as a surrogate markers of NRF2 activity. So if you, can, if you see increase in NQ1, we say, oh, NRF2 is high because NRF2 regulates this target gene. So that's the one way of measuring the readout for the NRF2 activity. You know antioxidants. Okay, I'm just giving a small uh, information on that. So antioxidants are like, you know, uh, and the good analogy will be uh, they cover the uh, game. So, uh, so the antioxidants are the defenders, and these ROS is the uh, uh, is the uh, what do you call the radar. So, the goal of antioxidants is to protect uh, to to you know, catch this ROS and make it harmless. They bind it and neutralize it. So, that's the role of antioxidants. So, you are very familiar with this non-enzymatic antioxidants, which are vitamin C, vitamin E, bilirubin, GSS. They work at one-to-one -one ratio, one molar to one molar ratio. That means one molecule will react with one molecule of ROS and they neutralize it. But, so, so this way, you need to replenish your vitamins or other uh, antioxidants every time. 
NR of two, on the other hand, regulates, upregulates antioxidant enzymes. These enzymes are much more efficient. They get, they don't get used up during reaction, right? So they are, they are hundred thousand times more efficient than the vitamin C, vitamin E, and they did, need not be present in high levels. A small amount is enough. Examples are of uh, antioxidant enzymes are superoxidismutase. You heard of catalase, you heard of the peroxidase. So these are the enzymes which are regulated by NRF2. <clears throat> so conclusion of my part one is that it NRF2 upregulation of NRF2 pathway will increase lot of protective genes, protective proteins which protect from environmental stressors. So these are the list of uh, genes which NRF2 regulates. Um, to which I have already discussed about, right? So I'm going to skip this part and go next part. Now, I gave you the basic information of NRF2, and I also told you that the disease is caused by oxidative stress, inflammation, cell death, and aberrant tissue repair. So this VCS cycle keeps on continuing for, for many years because you are getting exposed to this stressor constantly. Now, because NRF2 upregulates genes which can protect or mitigate this oxidative stress, inflammation, cell death, this could be a potential therapeutic strategy. If you can upregulate NR2, you can prevent the disease, mitigate the disease, and possibly treat the disease also. So this is the whole paradigm. The next part of the, my talk will be focused on. So how did we develop uh, NR targets? Okay. To, to develop any uh, target for drug therapy, when I say target, it's a protein in your cell, that needs to be either increased or decreased or inhibited. These are the three mechanisms how a, a, a drug works. For example, if you want to inhibit cholesterol in your, in your body or reduce cholesterol, we take statins. Now, what do statins do? They inhibit an enzyme called HMG coreopis. The same way, so like, like this, there, every drug has a drug target. Like if you take corticosteroids, they inhibit the, the NFKB signaling path, which is uh, important for uh, regulating inflammation. So like that, in order to prove that this is a promising drug target, we need to create generate evidence. To generate evidence, what are the model system we use? We use cells and mice. These are wild type. That means they are the normal cells and mice. If I want to know the importance of NRF2 in protecting a disease, I need to have a cell or a mice where we have knocked out NRF2. So we call this an NRF2 deficient cell or mice by 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 recombinant technology, we can knock out any gene. And if you knock out uh, some genes, it will be lethal. The, 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 there'll be no, you know, the pups die post uh, uh, fertilization, but some genes they don't. Uh, if you knock out some genes, they don't, there's no death, but you can use this model to study how important they are in the normal physiology. So we have developed wild type. We have an after knockout mouse. And then we can also develop a genetic mouse model wherein we knock out a stripper cell. Remember in the, in the last two slides back, I'll show you the cartoon. The KEEP1 is a repressor. That means if you knock out KEEP1, you will have hyperactivation of NRF2 pathway because there's nobody to hold NRF2. So all the NRF2, whatever is produced, will be retained in the nucleus and they will do its function. So this mouse or a cell will have hyperactivation of NRF2. And then we use pharmacological activators of NRF2. That means if I use a, a, a small molecule like sulforaphane, which is a natural product, or any of these molecule, it will increase, increase NRF2 activity. So using these four model systems, we can prove that NRF2 could be a promising drug target. How do we do that? We take a cell or mouse exposed to environmental stressor, then measure the disease biomarker. So if this is the wild type, that means the normal cell or normal mice, when I expose to a particular toxicant, say for example, asthma, if I uh, induce asthma in a mouse, it will show this much of symptoms or this much of injury. If I knock out an RF2, if it shows this much of injury, that means for sure there is higher disease marker. That means somehow an RF2 is playing an important role. But still, it does not confirm that is an RF2 a good target for developing drugs. In order to prove that, I need to have this model where I increase the NRF2 activity and show that the disease is now being elevated decreased. So in this model, if I see that the disease is almost very low or nil, or if the mouse is protected, that means I know activation of an RF2 will be very important to protect from the disease. The same way, if I use a pharmacological activator, 
it should decrease the disease. So if I find this scenario in my experiments, then I can say an R is a promise for that factor. So I'm going to show you different diseases, what a uh, few diseases, and show you that how we have proven that an R2 is a promising target, target. And these phytochemicals, or rather, uh, this is a phytochemical, it's a natural product. I'm going to talk more about this one. These three are synthetic, they're chemically synthesized, and they have been shown to be very good activator for NRF2. So uh, I'm not, because of lack of time, I'm not able to show you how they discovered it, but take my word that these are all good activators of NRF2. So when I say activator of NRF2, that means it will activate the NRF2 signaling pathway and all these protective genes, what I discussed in the last slide, will be high. And therefore, the cell will have ability to defend against any stresses it experiences. Now, the first model what we studied was uh, 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 role of NRF2 in respiratory diseases. So we have evidences that if you increase NRF2, it can protect from all these diseases. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about all the disease, but I'm going to talk about COPD and asthma. COPD is a, 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 is a, a, is a second leading, a second or rather third leading, leading cause of death across the world and in India also. And COPD is a primarily a smoker disease. It was a smoker disease, but now even air pollution caused COPD. Biomass fuel that you all know uh, in the villages uh, while cooking, uh, we use crop, we use wood. So that smoke, whatever is coming, that can also cause COPD. What are the symptoms of COPD? You have problems in breathing. You, the lungs <coughs> are destroyed. So the patient is able to inhale well, but is unable to exhale back. As a result, you cannot inhale oxygenated air. So you'll have oxygen level decreases in your body. So you get exhausted. Right? You can't walk, you can't do any, uh, any physical activity, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the patient uh, remains very disabled. With time, he, he, he dies of heart attack or muscular problems, so a lot of problems because oxygen is less. So, so when oxygen is less, your heart has to work more because there's more load on the heart to pump. So, uh, so that causes uh, you know, hypertrophy of the heart and causes heart attack and, uh, and other problems. <clears throat> so COPD is a very disabling disease. And you know asthma, everybody know asthma. Basically you have bronchial constrictions and the patient is unable to uh, breathe well during when you get asthma attack. The difference between COPD and asthma is that by taking a bronchodilator, probably you've seen the inhaler, what uh, the patient takes, he recovers back, you know, function is back. But in COPD, there's no medicine. The symptoms are almost same, but the, 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 there's no uh, no uh, bronchodilator working for COPD. It, it is, it's a progressive disease. <clears throat> We can create COPD in, in, in mouse models. How do we do that? We, we smoke this mice. Basically, we put in a chamber and, and, and generate cigarette smoke. We burn the cigarette. It's, it's a machine where it automatically takes a, a cigarette, burns it, and then the smoke which comes is, is now let into a chamber where the mouse is sitting there. So we expose the wild type, which is a normal mice, and we expose the NRF2 knockout mice, which is there's no deficiency of NRF2. And then after six months, we looked at the, uh, the lungs, and we found that the lungs of wild type mouse has, has holes, but in the knockout mice, you have bigger holes. So the, this each hole is called as alveoli. They are the, 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 where the gas exchange happens. This, if the septa is broken, that means there's a, a bigger, bigger holes are formed in the lungs. And that's what is seen in the lungs of a smoker, cigarette smoker or tobacco smoker. If you take the lung and take the sections, you'll see big holes forming because the air is trapped in that and the, and the muscular activity, the elasticity is lost. So, so the lung cannot compress and expel the air. So same phenotype we see in the knockout lungs. We can quantify this. And what we see is that <clears throat> the percent increase in the alveolar diameter, which, which indicates the, the alveolar size, is, is, is slowly it increases in the knockout mice. Whereas in normal mice, it is not. So that means this data tells you that an R2 signaling is very important to protect from cigarette smoke induced lung injury. Okay, is that true? Yes, we found that by giving an R2 activator, which is here, a, a, the chemical activity is called CDDO, we can show that it can protect the normal mice, but the, not the knockout mice, which tells you that this drug is working only when an R2 is present in these cells. See, there was an injury of 17%. By giving the drug, we could reduce it to 5 and 7%. Whereas in the knockout, the injury was 23%, but the, there was no effect of the drug at all. So this tells you that <clears throat> the drug is working through an R2 signaling pathway. 
Okay, so now this is another model where it's the asthma model. We can uh, we can induce asthma in mouse audits. And this is the wild type mice. This is an of knockout mice. As you can see, this pink color. This means there are more WBCs around the airways. Okay, and this tells you that there is more inflammation in the lungs of the knockout. Same way, uh, and in asthma, the asthma is mainly mediated by eosinophils. This is one type of WBCs. So you see more of this brownish color than the wild type mouse. This tells you that more eosinophil accumulation is in the lung of the knockout mouse. And the, and the asthma, you have more mucus secretion. So you have more mucus producing cells in the airways of this knockout mice compared to the wild type mice. And uh, other people have shown that by giving the, uh, the phytochemical sulforaphane, you can decrease the asthmatic phenotype in the wild type, but not in the knockout mice. Again, suggesting that <coughs> you can target an to protect from asthma. <coughs> That was COPD and asthma. Uh, and now we have shown that even an, a, a targeting an RF2 can improve your, your innate immune defenses against viruses and bacteria too. <clears throat> These are the common viruses. You, the influenza virus is a very cold virus we call. Every year we get cold. Uh, respiratory sensual virus is a, is, a, is a virus which causes cold in the, in the babies, infants. Very common in this one. <clears throat> uh, this uh, simplex virus causes sores and the mouth lips around the lips and all that that's a virus you all know hepatitis b virus and you all know what is the virus and uh, these three bacteria are the common lung bacteria okay we often get and causes pneumonia <coughs> so this is a data published by this uh, uh, this uh, uh, group uh, the cho et al group <coughs> where they shown that uh, by infecting the knockout mice with the rsv the, you, can, you can measure the sickness of the mice by looking at the body weight loss. If the mice is very sick, it loses its weight very, very fast. It's like patients. Uh, in some patients, they lose weight within one week. In the same way, the mouse also loses its weight after infecting with this virus. And you can see this, is the, uh, this line represents the NR2 knockout mice, and this is a wild type mice. You can see there is a larger decrease in the body weight compared to the wild type mice. And if you look at the lungs, you'll see this pink color. This means there are more WBCs in the lungs of this knockout than the, uh, <clears throat> this is the wild type, this is the knockout mice. And if you look at the viral particles in the lungs, in the wild type, it is less, in the knockout, it's more. This is uh, by two different methods, they have measured it. And what it says that in the knockout, there is more viral replication. Therefore, there is more inflammation in the lung and therefore there is a more body loss. Conclusion is that, NRF2 is very important to protect from viral inflammation too. This is another study which uh, done by this group, uh, Weiler et al., <coughs> where they've shown that if you use a pharmacological activator of NRF2, which is, could be a budoxyl methyl, which is CDDO, or sulforaphane, you can inhibit the viral replication also of a herpes simplex virus. You can also inhibit the viral replication of hepatitis B virus. So besides antioxidant and besides anti-inflammatory function, it can also modulate the immune response to kill or to suppress the viral replication. That's what I want to convey. <clears throat> this is a data showing how a pharmacological active phenar of 2D dimethyl fumarate can attenuate viral replication, HIV viral replication in, in macrophages. The same way with sulforaphane. I'm going to talk about this drug more, but what the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it can suppress the viral replication. <clears throat> Now, some may ask you, is it, uh, <coughs> will it work against the coronavirus? <coughs> because coronavirus, this particular coronavirus is new. There are evidence suggesting that pharmacological active and RF2 can also mitigate the viral replication. Because <coughs> the coronavirus, they enter into cell by binding to a, a, a protein called spike protein. Or rather, spike protein is around the virus. The spike protein binds to the <coughs> AC, AC2 receptor on, present on the lung epithelial cells. If you can block the AC2 receptor on your cells, the virus cannot enter. And what people are hypothesizing and shown a little bit of data is that these uh, activators, the NRF2 activators, can suppress the AC2 expression. Therefore, the viral replication can be halted also. So there is evidence, but not full blown now. <clears throat> this is a data showing how if you increase NRF2 activity, you can increase the phagocytic function of alveolar macrophages. Macrophages are the cells in your lungs, the alveolar macrophages are the cells in your lungs, which they, they, they bind to the bacteria that, that you breathe in, that you inhale. Binds it, eats it. 
and we call this process called phagocytosis. If it able to phagocytize the bacteria only, then it is able to kill. In case of COPD patients, what we see is that the macrophages in these patients are not functional. That means they are unable to phagocytize the bacteria. If they cannot phagocytize the bacteria, they cannot kill it. And therefore, the patients of COPD, they have a lot of bacterial colonies in their lungs. And that is the cause for their uh, you know, progress of the disease and all that. What we found is that if we take the macrophages from these patients and treat it with sulfur, which is a pharmacological active NR2, we can improve or we can restore its phagocytic function. This is a, a, a macrophage treated with the vehicle. This is a macrophage treated with the, uh, with the drug. You can see <coughs> the, the, the number of bacteria came down by treating the cell with, uh, with sulfur, whereas in the vehicle, there was high. The, the each line represent one patient. So we took almost 10 patients here. In the same way here also, this is uh, uh, against the hemophilus influenza bacteria and this is pseudomonas aeruginous bacteria. And we could see that we can label the bacteria and we can measure whether the bacteria is inside the cell or outside the cell. By, so if the, in the macrophages, which we treated with vehicle, showed this many bacteria inside the cell, but by treating with sulforaphane, we could see more number of bacteria inside the cell. This is a, a technique where we can, by flow method, we can measure the internalized bacteria. So, <clears throat> so this is another model. I showed you the smoke model, I showed you the asthma model, then I showed you the virus and bacterial model, and this is a radiation model. I'm trying to show you how different stresses, uh, they induce different injuries, but NRF2 can predict from all these stresses. This is a radiation model. And this project, we started to, to develop drugs for, uh, for scenarios like if there is a nuclear accident. Like, you know, six years back, you, you heard of uh, in Japan, there was a Fukushima nuclear accident where people got exposed to uh, radiations, ionizing radiations. Or imagine if there is a terrorist attack and they use a nuclear attack, uh, a nuclear bomb. So in that case, what happens wherever there is a, uh, the bomb blast happens, the people surrounding them will get exposed to high levels of radiations. And these are ionizing radiations. They are similar to your X-rays. And once, once somebody gets exposed, depending upon the radiation dose, you experience different symptoms. One of the earliest symptoms, what we call is hemat hematopoietic uh, syndrome, wherein your bone marrow cells are totally destroyed. Remember, the bone marrow is the one which produces your WBCs. If there is no bone marrow, no WBCs production. So if you expose to a patient or to, a, to an animal with an X-ray of a particular dose, with the time, the patient will die over a period of 30, 30 days. Why they die is because with the time you see that WBCs in the cell, which is supposed to be 5,000 cells per microliter, almost comes to few cells and that is totally rid of WBCs. So the, the, now the patient uh, gets infection and he dies of sepsis. In the same way, in the mouse also, we can, we can, uh, you know, we can use the same uh, phenotype here. So in this case, what we did is we took the mouse and exposed the wild type and the knockout mice to radiation, and they followed the survival over a bit of 30 days. We can see that, as you can see the curve, almost 50% mouse died in the knockout group at the, this particular growth. It was only you know, 20, uh, 15 percent died in the wild type mouse. If you increase the dose to 7.25 grays, all mice died, knockout mice died within you know a um, few days. But as still, I could see almost you know 40, uh, or rather uh, 40 percent of uh, uh, survival was there in the wild type mouse. What tells you that an RF2 is very important to protect from ionizing radiation. Now we wanted to develop a drug which can protect from radiation induced injury. And this drug has to be given post-radiation, not pre-radiation. Imagine a scenario where there is a terrorist attack. You need a drug which can, be, which can work post in people who are exposed to radiation. You cannot give the drug before they are exposed, right? In this case, our goal was to give the drug 24 hours post-radiation. So what happened? We gave the radiation to the mouse. And then day one, we gave the, started the drug treatment day one, day three, day five, day seven, day nine, day 11. So there were totally six doses of the drug. And then we followed the survival of this mouse over a period of 30 days. And the drug, what we used was, we discovered this as a potential activator. We call this as uh, a charcoal derivative. As you can see here, this is a wild type mouse. Without the drug, the vehicle, almost 80% you know, mice died. By giving the drug post 24 hours, we could you know, survive more number of mice here. We could protect almost, almost all mice. 
we increase the dose, we could still see the protection here. And when we started giving, we, when we increase the dose from 7.1 to 7.3 grays, we could protect if we are given the drug one hour post exposure. It was less effective post 24 hours. And this all data indicates that the drug is working and it can improve the survival. And if you look at the, the, the bacterial colony in the, in the blood, you can see in the drug treated ones, hardly any bacteria, but in the vehicle you see a lot more bacteria. The death is because of sepsis. Sepsis is a syndrome caused by systemic infection. And the drug failed to work in the knockout mice, indicating the drug is working only through an R2 mechanism. Okay, so this is one data. And this is a picture showing you know, how the bone marrow looks. On day 23 post radiation, you can see all. Oh, so usually a normal mouse will have this kind of purple, heavily purple color cells there. You can see hardly any cells inside this bone marrow. But uh, drug treated mice, we see more number of cells, which tells you that the bone marrow is able to proliferate and replenish the bone marrow cells. Now, I showed you so many diseases, like I showed you at least five diseases. And people have studied in every disease. In every disease, an R2 pathway is shown to be protective. You take any disease which you know. In every disease, we see that an R2 is very important. Why? Because an R2 protects from oxidative stress, protects from inflammation, protects from cell death. And these are the three ingredients for every disease. So if you can reduce this, you can protect from disease. So based on this, all this evidence, all the pharma companies are hotly pursuing to develop drugs against this protein, an RF2. Okay, I'm going to, sh uh, I'm not going to discuss much because there's no time, but I can show you that, you know, this is a company, Riata, which has been developing drugs against all these diseases, and they are doing clinical testing. They are in the, in the last stage of clinical testing. Phase three is the last stage. So they are doing it for uh, different diseases. Uh, they did it for one disease called chronic kidney disease in diabetic patient, but they had to stop because the drug was not effective and was killing more patients. But now they're trying the same drug in different disease conditions. Already one drug is outside in the market, which is called as dimethylfumarate, which is a drug for multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a disease of neurological uh, disease, wherein your neurons are uh, losing myelin sheath, and therefore the patient undergoes severe uh, motor problems and very painful disease. So, so this drug is available in the market, and people are using, uh, and the drug company is selling it as an R2 activator. But my interest would be today to, to focus on the food. Are there any food that contains pharmacological activators of an RF2? If we consume that, can we protect from environmental diseases? So that's my, uh, the last part of the talk. And I'm going to talk about one particular phytochemical called sulforaphane. And this sulforaphane is present in broccoli. I hope you all know, you have seen broccoli, probably most of you guys have eaten this broccoli. Broccoli is more like a cauliflower. And this cauliflower, uh, uh, belongs to cruciferous vegetables, and most of the cruciferous vegetables have this this phytochemical sulforaphane, which I have, uh, which I showed you the data in the mouse models also. So, so we call this edible isothiocyanate. The broccoli, uh, the content of sulforaphane in the broccoli is less compared to sprouts. You take the seeds and make it sprout. So, three grams of sprouts is almost equivalent to 150 grams of broccoli to get the same amount of sulforaphane. So sulforaphane is more in the uh, broccoli sprouts. And these two uh, gentlemen are the main discoverers of that. The doctor, Professor Paul Talale is the one who discovered this sulforaphane in, this, um, uh, in the broccoli. And uh, he expired, he passed away just two years back. Uh, Jed, he's the one who's now continuing to work this one. So basically they are the pioneers in, 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 in identifying it and, and testing whether this could be helpful in mitigating diseases. <clears throat> so sulforaphane is present in the broccoli in the form of glucorophanin. It's a precursor of sulforaphane. So uh, glucorophanin is converted to sulforaphane by the enzyme called myrosinase. So when you bite or chew this broccoli, the cell rupture happens, and when the cell ruptures, when the cell membrane is damaged, the myrosinase enzyme is released out. And this immediately, the myrosinase enzyme will convert glucorophane into sulforaphane. And the sulforaphane is the bioactive component, not the glucorophane. Even your intestine gut flora can digest this glucorophane, they can secrete myrosinase and convert into sulforaphane. So, both ways, you can, when you eat a cruciferous vegetables, uh, it can be converted to sulforaphane by the action of myrosinase. So myrosinase enzyme is very important. Now, 
I'm going to share some uh, data on how they showed that how this broccoli sprout could be very uh, important nutraceutical. Now they made the nutraceuticals. Uh, sorry, uh, they 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 made this broccoli sprouts. You know, basically you 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 can use a seed and uh, put them in a moisture and little humid condition, and they start sprouting. They took the sprouts and and see what they did. They boiled it for thirty minutes and filtered it, and they took only the water content of the the boiled part. To this boiled water extract, they added the enzyme myrosinase enzyme. And this myrosinase enzyme is present in very high quantity in radish sprouts. Okay, so they they took the radish seeds, sprouted it, and and then homogenized it, grinded it, and they put that grinded part in this water extract. So what happened? The all the glucuronin was converted to sulforaphane, and this liquid, whatever is present now, they freeze dried it, basically made it to powder, and this powder was used. As in the form, you can add it to a juice or you can make it to capsules. So these are the two ways how they delivered the the sulforaphane uh, enriched broccoli sprout extract powder. So think so this is a is a food. Now you are using this food as a medicine. So that's why it's called as nutraceutical. Okay. This is one study where they showed that by giving broccoli sprout extract rich in sulforaphane for 12 weeks, they could reduce the blood sugar level in diabetic patients. This is the the placebo group, which they were given only no. There was no drug here, and this was the 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 phytochemical sulforaphane. As you can see, it could reduce the blood sugar, and this could this is mainly give. Uh, they they found the mechanisms, and they found that it decreases the gluconeogenesis process in the liver. Gluconeogenesis means you synthesize glucose, right? The liver is a the target organ to synthesize glucose. <coughs> so it, so the the sulforaphane. Could reduce these enzymes involved in the gluconeogenesis. So, the the the, the take-home message is: by eating this broccoli sprout extract, you can control the blood sugar level in diabetic patients. This is another study wherein they gave this powder, the sulforaphane-rich powder, in a juice, and 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 they studied whether this beverage, which is having the broccoli sprout. Can increase detoxification of environmental pollutants, air pollutants. They did the study in China, and in China, like India, had very high levels of air pollution. And uh, what they did is they they gave uh, either the placebo or the broccoli sprout beverage uh, in the juice form. So they they took this much of amount, put it in the water, and then added to the juice. Uh, pineapple juice and ju and the lime juice at this ratio, and they gave this beverage to all the participants. And, of, and at at uh, <clears throat> different time periods, they they collected the urine and the blood from these uh, participants, and they measured uh, the air pollutants, mainly benzene, acrolein, and crotonaldehyde. Benzene is an air pollutant that causes cancer. Acrolein is an irritant that causes injury. And crotonal is another aldehyde which causes injury. So they, so in your body, when you get exposed to these uh, chemicals, they are conjugated with a, a, a glutathione, and they become mercaptic acid. That's how you excrete through urine. So they found that the moment the participants started taking the beverage, they were able to excrete the detoxified metabolite of this benzene than the group which was not having the beverage of broccoli sprout, and it continued till. Till 80 days, 84 days, whatever they did. So, what is uh, the take-home message is by consuming this beverage rich in this sulforaphane, you can increase the detoxification of air pollutants. And you know, air pollutant causes tissue injury. It can cause uh, it can cause uh, lung diseases. It can cause cardiovascular disease. So, this is one therapeutic approach by taking a diet rich with this kind of chemicals. You can mitigate the toxic effects of air pollutants. And this is another one which shows you that uh, by taking this broccoli sprout extract rich in sulforaphane, you can decrease the allergic response. So they took patients who are uh, who are healthy, but they were showing allergic to cat, and then they instilled the diesel exhaust particles, which are the trigger of uh, allergy, and they found that by giving this uh, broccoli sprout extract, they could reduce the symptoms as well as the As well as the cell number, which is which indicate uh, basically inflammation, which which suggests that by by taking this uh, this formulation, you can protect from allergic diseases also. 
we also did on our lab we did uh, uh, tested uh, sulforaphane in pseudopd patients and uh, we we gave two doses of sulforaphane one was 24 25 micromoles and 150 micromoles 150 micromoles almost uh, comes to almost 25 milligrams of sulforaphane and uh, this was a multi-center trial we did three different hospitals in india we did uh, uh, multi-center trial in india and uh, we did uh, uh, three different hospitals in india and we did 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 three different hosp
So what we found is if you can take the leaves, grind it or chop it, whatever you want to do, and then leave it for half an hour. This half an hour is enough to convert the glucomonogen into monogen. And now you use that, you know, that, uh, that <coughs> grinded part to uh, you boil it down and use it for making curry. Therefore, you have monogen is quite stable in, at a high temperature also. So this way, you can increase NR2 activity. And all this good part of broccoli, what I showed you in terms of diabetes, in terms of air pollution, uh, correction from air pollutants, or even from uh, 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 autistic syndrome, same thing probably the Moringa leaves can also do. But still the evidence is not there. We are, we are working on that uh, to do tests uh, or rather to do clinical trials and see if it really works out. But my hunch is that it will be as good as your broccoli. So this is plenty, plentyly available in, in, our, in our community. So you can rely on this Moringa leaves uh, <clears throat> than the broccoli. So conclusion of my talk is that what I, maybe I convinced you that Neutroceuticals targeting NRF2 are promising therapeutics for prevention and mitigation of environmental chronic diseases, which could be respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, neurological diseases, and many are there. Basically, the whole idea is that I told you that disease takes uh, to, to onset of disease and full blown disease takes 10 years. In this 10 years, if you can change your lifestyle, if you can change your diet, rich in phytochemicals that can activate an R2 pathway, probably you can slow, mitigate, or rather even, even prevent the disease as such. So that's the whole paradigm that, that we and other people are working. And I, I sincerely believe that you know, the, the dietary intervention is the only way of preventing this disease because treatment is not complete. The, 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 the drugs available are, uh, are only gives symptomatic relief. They don't, uh, you know, uh, mitigate the, the progress of the disease. So, so to mitigate it, you need drug like an RF, uh, drug which can target an RF2. That because NRF2 not only prevents oxygen distress inflammation, it can also help in repair process also. So, so diet rich in phytochemicals and most of the phytochemicals that we uh, uh, they, they, they can activate an RF2 pathway to a different degree. Like uh, phytochemicals we call curcumin, which we use in turmeric, can also increase it. But the, the the, in the turmeric, you have curcumin, which is a bioactive compound. It's very, very small amount. So you need to eat at least grams of turmeric to get that kind of uh, active ingredient uh, level in your blood. So, so uh, that is one. You have uh, polyphenols, quercetin, which is available in apple, onions. So all these green vegetables, they have these flavonoids or polyphenols, which are good activators for NARF2. So having diet rich in, in vegetables, is, is one way of mitigating your chronic diseases because they have pharmacological properties to activate an after pathway. Okay, so I'm going to, this is my last slide. I want to thank whatever data I shared you was, uh, was the result uh, from uh, data from, from, you know, when I was working at Johns Hopkins University, these are the people who are involved. And at, uh, in my current lab, we have, uh, uh, these are the students who are doing my PhD under me. And uh, we had one postdoc fellow who moved to uh, last year to Chicago. And I have uh, clinicians, uh, collaborators, Dr. Mahesh and uh, Amruta is from USA, which we are working with her on air pollution project. And my lab is funded with uh, DBT, DST, BIRAC, ICMR uh, grants. So I'm going to stop here. I think I took more, than, more time than what is allotted. I'm sorry for that. And I'm ready to take any questions you have. So it was really a wonderful session. Thank you very much for uh, such a fantastic and uh, because uh, I'm a physics person, I'm, uh, I don't know anything about uh, hello? this. Uh, hello, can you hear me, sir? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? You have any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are questions. Hello? Can you hear me? I think there is some bandwidth problem. That is a... Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, sir? Hello? Okay, let me check. Hello? 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 Sir? Can you hear me, Balu, sir? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, fine, okay. So then the bandwidth Any is correct. Any questions? Yes, sir, there are sir. questions. 
You can ask the questions even using the chat if you have. Yes, sir. There are questions in the chat. Now, uh, the question from Usha Rani K.A. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Rajesh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, can NRF2 activators be used against different cancers? I think, sir, okay, okay. Uh, sir is not audible. I think so. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Hello? So can you hear Rajesh sir? Hello? Rajesh sir, can you hear? Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, sir. I can hear. But yourself? Hello? Yes. Dr. Rajesh sir? Hello? Sir, Kelly Stadilla? Bala Sir Kelly Stadilla? Sir Kelly Okay, fine. Hello, Balu? Uh, sir. Kelly Sir. Sir, uh, the call, Madi, sir. Okay? Now, what is the So can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Sir? Sir, can you study? Sir, can you study, sir? Take a sir, the can you connect up there? Sir, uh... Unmute my unmute my unmute. But signal act for Thailand. Others can hear me, right? Madam Nim Kelstaria. Hello, Madam Kelstaria. Kelis to the Kelis to the Nim Vice. Okay. I'm Suguna. Kelis to the Nim Vice. Okay, wait. Rajesh, sir? Hello? Sir, you have questions. Sir, Rajesh, sir? Yes, sir. 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 Sir, Dr. Jyoti, yes, sir. Hello? Sir? Sir, Kerala question? No? Uh, Kelly, sir. Sir, uh, I mean, uh, he oh, has Lord. been unmuted. Uh, mute, oh, uh, unmute, I have a question. Kelly, yes, sir. I think he has some bandwidth problem. Kelly, Kelly. Hello? 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 Hello?
ಹೌದ ಓಕೆ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದರ್ ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನ್ ಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ಹೌದು ಹೌದು ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನ್ ಕೇಳಿ 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 ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನ್ ಕೇಳಿ ಸರ್ ರಾಜು ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ರಾಜೇಶ್ ಸರ್ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಸರ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಫೋನ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಆಡಿಬಲ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಓಕೆ ಓಕೆ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಹಲೋ ಹಾ ಫೋನ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೇಳ್ಬಿಡ್ರಿ ಯಾಕೆ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಕೇಳ್ಸ ಅಲ್ವಾ ಹೌದಾ ಬಟ್ ನಾನು ಟಾಕ್ ಕೇಳ್ಸತೆ ಇಲ್ವಾ ಹೌದಾ ಶುಡ್ ಐ ರೀಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಅವಾಟ್ Okay, I'll reconnect it, okay? Okay. So you are audible now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Now audible? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the, the question from Usharani KA, mm-hmm. can NRF2 mm-hmm. activators be used against different cancers? Okay. So, so there are two things to consider. Yes, sir. One is cancer prevention and one is cancer treatment. For cancer prevention, NRF2 activators are very good. For cancer treatment, NRF2 activators may not be good at all. because so like i showed you it can prevent the damage right and the damage to dna is a cause for the cancer so if you can prevent the damage to dna you can prevent the cancer but in cancer the damage is already hope uh, is already you know uh, happened and the cancer is full grown so in cancer cells what they do is they hijack an rf2 pathway for survival because cancer cell has to fight against the normal cells right so they need a robust response stress response so in most of the cancers what we see is that an r2 pathway has been hijacked by mutation mechanisms so by giving an r2 activators to the cancer patient it does not help much okay so yes, yes, so an r2 activators are good for prevention of cancer but not for the treatment okay you need an r2 inhibitors for cancer treatment which yes, is sir. a different story i didn't want to go into that yes sir uh another question from uh, usha rani uh sulforaphane mm-hmm. has uh, any side effects that's the question from her. so sulforaphane if you eat in the form of broccoli no side effects except gas people have shown that people who consume a lot of so it 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 it, it, it causes a lot of gas problem otherwise we haven't seen any side effects in patients uh who took sulforaphane as a capsule and broccoli is widely eaten by western countries i i my i used to like a lot other than the gas problem there is no other side effects thank you uh, the next question is from veena sn uh, a treated tb patient who was 20 years old girl uh, treated successfully a, a pulmonary tb is there any risk of uh, attack of tb at any stage of her uh, life span and uh, which can be the dietary supplement that can uh, avoid the same so so tb is a very complicated disease uh, even after post treatment okay yes. there is a relapse there are cases of relapse of tb and the relapse is directly related to the immunity of the person if the person is uh, healthy and has any enough immunity they they recover they don't get any recurrence but if the person has weak immunity 
there is a likelihood that he may get again. Okay, but whether NR2 activators can help, there's no data, hard evidence. But you know, it it improves the overall immunity. So I I kind of you know think that yeah, it may help. It will not harm it, but it may not, you know, it it may help little bit. But I would not bet on that. Uh, next question from Anita Somarna. Uh, are methi seeds sports have uh, equivalent to drumstick leaves? That was the I don't know that part. Fine, sir. Fine. I'm not sure of that. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Jyoti S. Upar. Uh, apart from uh, Moninga, uh, which other vegetables or plants can be used as uh, nutricicals? Most of the cruciferous vegetables, you know, it could be radish, it could be cauliflower, it could be cabbage, moringa, they all have some amount of, uh, you know, isothiocyanates, which can activate it. So besides that, I would say even, uh, um, what do you call, green leaves, like quercetin, which is like, for example, if you have uh, apple, onions, uh, kale, or uh, these these also have other polyphenols which could be as good activators as sulforaphane. Okay. Yes, sir. So same uh, from uh, Jyoti, madam. Uh, hmm. She's telling uh, most of the others are also telling uh, it is very informative and all. So there are a lot of appreciations in the chat box. And uh, thank you all. I, yes, I, sir. Yes, sir. I hope that you understood the science behind it. <laughs> ah, I know okay. sometimes we are so. Uh, in, involved so that we over, overboard ourselves with so much of knowledge that I, at the end, I see that audience are, you know, don't know what to take it. So I'm really sorry if I've gone overboard with that. Uh, no, sir, it's really uh, good, in, really good. Yes, sir. Uh, there is a question from uh, Sophia S. Apart from bro broccoli, any other vegetables can be uh, used instead of that? Like I said, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, in, in our uh, 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 tropical weather countries, Moringa is a good source. And beside, you know, uh, Moringa, ha Moringa leaves have, in fact, Moringa tree is a magical tree. You take every part of the Moringa tree, which we call drumstick tree, even drumstick has the highest protein, uh, concept, uh, protein value, nutrition value compared to any other vegetable. Moringa leaves, people earlier used to say that they have iron rich also. They have done trials, but the trials have been not very, you know, conclusive. But uh, apart from Moringa, uh, like I said, cruciferous vegetables are good source of uh, uh, sulforaphane. And, uh, and sulforaphane is one category of chemical, but I, like I said, quercetin is another, lot of polyphenols, flavonoids. Most of these plant uh, leaves and roots, they're rich in these flavonoids. So they can be also be potential in our activators. But there is a the bottom line is keep your you know, meal rich in green. Green will always help in activating, uh, if not NRF2, there will be other pathways which getting upregulated. They will be always protect you uh, in nature. There is a question from a student, Srinidhi BV. Uh, his question is, uh, uh, if keep one in inhibitor is removed in uh, knockout mice, do doesn't this over activities NRF2 signaling? Uh, does this cause overexpress? If it does, if it does, uh, does not it have has problems? I didn't get what is the question. Right. Please, yes, yes. Right. The question is, if you remove the repressor, keep one, which which controls an RF2 uh, in the cytoplasm. If you remove that, what will happen? If you remove that, there is an overactivation of an RF2 in the cells. Right. Uh, so so, if you remove this keep one in the whole body in every cell of the mouse. The mouse dies within two weeks. The reason is the NR2 also regulates a lot of collagen genes. So the, the pups, uh, after one week of their birth, they develop uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of a um, esophagus problem and they're unable to drink the milk from the mother and they die. So to, to circumvent this problem, what uh, we and other people have done is we have knocked out keep on in a specific organ. Like for example, you can knock out keep on only in the liver. The rest of the body is fine. And you can knock out this, this gene at a particular age of the mouse also. So when we did that, the mouse was fine and it was robust mice. That means it was 
protect it was showing protection against many diseases okay so yes genetic activation of nr2 by knocking out keep on is showing uh, protection against many diseases so thank you uh, the question is from uh, dr jyoti s upar does cooking or boiling affect the sulfur of in concentration and what is the best method for intake yes uh, like i said you know the the sulforaphane is present in its precursor form called glucuraphanin okay so the glucuraphanin uh, is converted to sulforaphane by the enzyme myrosinase when you heat your food when you cook it the the enzyme is killed so there is no conversion but then once you eat your gut microbiome can produce myrosinase enzyme and can digest it but then that is not that effective ideally <clears throat> uh, you know if you want to consume uh, any 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 cruciferous vegetables so that you can have an enriched amount of sulforaphane you crush it you crush before boiling you crush it and leave it for 15 20 minutes the enzyme which is present in the cell of the plant cell is released out does it function converts the glucuraphanin into sulforaphane and now you boil it then it is good enough now to consume it uh, the question from uh, sanat uh, can the sulforaphane be helpful in uh, treating uh, pneumonia naturally so like i said <clears throat> it can prevent okay the pneumonia but once you patient gets a pneumonia it's this will not work out so then you need uh, you know um the 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 drugs like corticosteroids and all that to control pneumonia the sulforaphane will not work it only prevents it oh, there is a and, question uh, uh, sulforaphane is sulforaphane or to to that to that matter most of these nr2 activators phytochemicals they do a good job in prevention and slowing down the disease they cannot correct the disease they cannot i mean they cannot uh, relieve the symptoms immediately that's why you know we know the ayurveda works great but ayurvedic medicines are slow and steady they can help in you know curing the disease when i say curing means you can reverse the disease but they cannot show a immediate symptomatic relief which the 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 other medicines can show so most of these phytochemical der derived medicines are slow and 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 can work to mitigate the process but not treatment yes sir thank you from gayatri uh, ms holla uh, she is asking a question that sir have you worked in uh, centella asitica or uh, ondelega ondelega i think i feel correct uh, <clears throat> we like i said i have a uh, list of uh, uh, herbal uh, rather phytochemicals or rather plants also one of my phd students is, is basically screening all these plants and uh, we have one of uh, we also have seen centella in that and whether it is uh, increasing uh, the nr2 activity as good as uh, moringa or sulforaphane i'm not sure of that i have to go back and look at it but it has some activity i feel uh, there is a question from uh, dr m n raghu Uh, radiotherapy is better way of uh, curing cancer is asking you so radiotherapy is a first treatment what does radiotherapy do basically uh, post surgery if the tumor is is grown big first the surgeon will remove the tumor and whatever the basal stem cells or whatever residues of cancer cells are there in that tissue has to be taken off by surgery you cannot take it off so radiotherapy is the only way to kill all the cancer cells around that okay even the after the best effort you see some some cells are resistant to radiotherapy also so radiotherapy is must for cancer treatment yes sir okay so another question from uh, anita somanna uh, the question is are methi seeds sports uh, as good as uh, drumstick leaves she is again asking that she want to answer to that uh, i'm i'm not sure of that i don't have any evidence for that fine sir fine and uh, sophia s yes, uh, madam is asking uh, can you name some products which are currently available in india and uh, cost is affordable by common people for any particular uh, there is uh, i mean like i said I moringa yes. is available <coughs> and uh, uh, even tulsi has uh, uh, has uh, uh phytochemicals that can activate this pathway mm, 
<coughs> um, what else? Like I said, onion has, apples have quercetin or flavonoids. So if you type and see flavonoid rich vegetables or leafy vegetables, you'll see a list of things. Probably the, all are good in, 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 in activating this pathway. And, and beyond this pathway also, I'm not talking about only this pathway, but pharmacologically, these flavonoids are very good in terms of disease prevention uh, approach. So there is an one question uh, from my side. Uh, are there, uh, because uh, now we are expecting this uh, viruses, uh, uh, corona or all these things, COVID-19 and all, uh, in future we may expect a lot more such viruses uh, can be expected or because uh, recent days we are expecting, I mean, we have seen a lot of such viruses. Uh, in, in future also, uh, is there any such type of uh, difficulties for human beings? Or something? <clears throat> My guess is as, as, as your guess, yes, there will be always. Uh, because <clears throat> we have, our habits have gone um, so wild uh, in terms of our uh, uh, food habits. And the, and the environment has also gone so bad that our immunity has gone down. Our diet has become more uh, rich in processed foods than the, in the, than the green vegetables. So, so these kind of viruses can reoccur. No doubt about it. And, uh, and this world is so small now. Uh, earlier we used to think, oh, well, we are here and uh, the virus is in China or in Africa. We don't have to worry. Now you can see a good example of how coronavirus within a period of six months, it has impacted the globe, right? There's no country, 187 countries are affected with this. So you can, one way you can think, so we are so close to each other, though distance wise we are far, but the impact is so much that every individual is suffering, right? So uh, yeah, I, I think that this kind of things could come reoccur. Um, only we have to uh, change our lifestyles to a great extent, because remember that, uh, in this corona uh, uh, virus also this in this pandemic also 90% of the patients who are suffering or who are dying are patients who have a comorbid condition that means they are either diabetic they are, they are hypertension they have some disease already happening or they are obese so 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 they these are the you know high risk people who have to be uh, taken care of much better so so if you can prevent this morbidity conditions like if you can have a good lifestyle, having good diet and exercise, I think you can, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, resist most of this uh, infectious disease. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, okay. Now in our laboratory, we have a uh, co-worker with us. Uh, she's working on uh, some uh, co-particles. I mean, she's synthesizing some nanoparticles, something like that. And uh, its intention is to cure for a drug which have been synthesized by a physics person and uh, which, which is intended to act for in biology, I mean, uh, medicinal applications. And for that, uh, uh, we, uh, can you tell some more things about that? Uh, because uh, we are the physics persons, we know how to synthesize the particles with the nanotechnology and all, and its applications in the interdisciplinary field. Can you explore some more about this? Uh, can you have some? So you're asking me that question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> see, the, the, the nano size particles, which could be nano zinc, nano carbon, nano titanium, nano size particles can, uh, you know, can be used, applied for antimicrobial activities. Like, for example, now these days, textiles have been coated with nano particles. Every damn uh, new stuff has been coated with something so that it, it can have properties of... Uh, uh, you know, antimicrobial at the same time, uh, <clears throat> uh, easy, easy washing or easy material. So I feel that nano uh, particles have, uh, you know, uh, they can be used for this kind of approaches, depending upon uh, whether you are intaking it or you're just using it. Like for example, if you can coat a mask or a, a personal protective uh, equipment with your nano guy, a nano material, which is showing antiviral activity that can prevent the transmission, right? So those kind of approaches you can still go on. But intake of that is, is still, you have to do a lot of uh, uh, testing to see that they are safe enough. So thank you. 
and uh, another one question uh, this is the question that uh, that may apply directly to our students and your professor uh, because you are a, a person from basic science and uh, you are uh, basic science of zoology and uh, you are working for medical sciences and all so i think in this session a lot of our students are there and uh, how to how do uh, they have to go for further uh, studies like uh, attaining research level or maybe for, for the medical fields and all uh, please explore uh, some more things in this regards thank you yeah so <clears throat> yeah that's a good question for all the students i think your background of your masters basically msc has very less uh, you know impact on future research what you carry on if you do phd in rather in botany microbiology biochemistry zoology <clears throat> rather masters in this subjects and then take on to phd program in the particular relevant area uh, you gain the knowledge to solve a problem okay that's it after phd based on your interest you can uh, you know enter into any area of medicine did not be that you are a botanist you have to stick on to only botanist botanical questions no so so if you are a chemist you don't you, the best biochemist are chemist the best pharmaceutical chemistry are chemist because they understand the 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 chemistry behind the molecules and you apply it to the biological field it becomes a biochemistry so so my <clears throat> you know my uh, suggestion would be to all the students is that if you are really interested in research continue with your uh, masters go do phd in a in a good lab and after phd if you want to move into a different area of research for example though your phd say you did it phd in your lung or a cancer area but you want to uh, you know move into another area of uh, 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 say if you want to neurological disorders you can easily move on i think there's nobody going to inhibit you uh, it's only thing that because you have trained in that area the opportunities in that area is much many are there but nobody is going to prevent you to cross to the next area so if you are serious about research and i would request all of you guys to do that is continue with your phd i think the opportunities will be many more besides ugc you know slowly is tightening uh, the academic saying that you know even uh, college level uh, teachers should have phd and all that so so there will be time when uh, phd could be a, a need uh, eligibility for every you uh, know academic uh, uh, faculty positions also so so if you are serious about pursuing your academics pursuing being want to teacher or want to be scientist then i would suggest go on with your phd and phd is just a training process you can jump to any area post phd so there are more questions in the chat box can i continue or uh, can we give you our uh, mail id something for that uh, uh if there are uh, yeah there are more maybe four another... questions four questions are there okay maybe you can finish that those four questions fine sir uh there is a question from uh, srinidhi bv a student hmm. is there any relationship with uh, jellyfish aging immunity with uh, this kind of uh, signaling that was the question uh, i don't know <laughs> i Fine, don't sir. know <coughs> uh, and uh, the question from uh, shrinath uh, can you suggest uh, some upcoming uh, contemporary research areas in zoology like i said don't uh, confine yourself zoology doesn't mean that you have to work on uh, uh, on invertebrates you can work on any vertebrate you can work on any mammal like i did my phd on a mammal only <clears throat> it's my, i use mouse models so even if you can you can have a fish himself so i don't think there is it all depends upon your interest there is nothing you cannot uh, uh, go and search for area which is you know uh which will fetch you high reward it's all depends upon your interest and the interest has to be contemporary to the present world if you do something which is uh, uh not important to society then the opportunity for you to grow in that area becomes very limited so so i would suggest you choose 
the area of interest depending upon the need depending upon the facilities available to you and depending upon your interest also this has to be there so thank you the question from uh, veena sn uh, what about the photocatalyty and uh, micro bio activities of a green synthesized uh, uh, nanomaterials which is uh, prepared by hydrothermal method i mean <clears throat> end of the day it's a it's a nano particle or nano nano formulation how you synthesize is the innovation there the application of this is you know you can apply it to life science you can apply it to physical science or anything so 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 uh, there's nothing uh, you know uh, problematic in that area yes sir it's just a procedure uh, yes sir the question from uh, dr ramy balasubramaniam does too many antioxidants in food danger to body there is no such thing like too many antioxidants when you eat your meal you have ideally what the american uh, cancer association or american heart association says that your meal should contain five different colors of vegetables right so five different antioxidants but how often do we have five different types of vegetables in a day we don't right so i don't think there is too much of antioxidant it just you your body knows okay i need to stop there <laughs> when your body says i need to stop there means you cannot add more than what you like right something you like you like sweet you keep on eating more and more same thing with vegetable you particular like a vegetable but if you have five vegetables you go to test all of them but i don't think you will go excess overboard on that and your body your system will not accept it <laughs> if you over eat you go to throw up all that right so so there is nothing like over antioxidant so thank you i because think because uh, these antioxidants are have a very small shelf life within 24 48 hours they are gone they are excreted from your body so they 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 can't you know remain in your body for long only genes which are activated can remain for the next 48 hours but most often you see that uh, these uh, phytochemicals they have very short uh, shelf life in your body yes sir there are uh, many questions so uh, i feel uh, this is uh, quite uh, relevant to some of the uh, faculty who are working in government institutions uh, sn veena needs that uh, uh, which are the funding agencies for uh, women uh, employees in government institutions or such thing like that if you suggest some funding agencies funding agencies the see dbt dst icmr they all fund uh research grants and uh uh in some cases they prefer they give preference to women always you know unwritten rule is that uh, uh, uh they have a uh, uh, priority for women also okay there are uh, uh, funding programs like biocare which is meant only for women uh so so you can think of that i mean you have to keep looking for opportunities and uh, dbt dst if you go to the websites you will see many programs aligned to particular area and in that area they may give preference to women also and there is a women scientist program itself dst has women scientist program where you, you can also apply there i think in my opinion you should not think that i need some kind of reservation for women that i can apply no if you have an idea and if you think that by collaborating with another uh, you know uh, a, a faculty who is expert in that you have him as a co investigator and you write up the grant it just you need a first grant once you get a first grant you know how to you know play the system and how you become good with time right so so don't have this uh, uh, you know opinion that oh i need to go and target only where i have got more of no the first thing is you write the grant send it to your friends and colleagues and see how good they are how good it is and then if you need expert most important in grant writing is beside the science is a team if team is good they going to fund you and the team should have that you have ability to do that research right you cannot uh, if you if you are unable to execute a problem then it's a science fiction and execution depends upon many things you know it can depends upon the facilities it can depends upon your expertise this is so what i do is when i write a grant i take if i don't have expertise in that area i take one more collaborator in that area it's just a part you share if you need some money in the grant you can give a little bit of cooking because he don't want to do he will not demand you i think the most important is go with your science and the team 
then comes the infrastructure of the uh, of your place of your uh, college of the university or whatever it is always you can say that i'm going to have access to this so and so lab in bangalore or somewhere which has this instrument i'm going to use that but ha have basic uh, uh, infrastructure to carry out this experiment so you can convince it to the reviewers and most often you win that argument so thank you very much you have been for with a long time with us uh, and there are more, more questions there are two more questions so uh, let, let us uh, give you our uh, email id and they can share with you some of their ideas if they are sure. more needed now we are uh, we have like chat uh, yes sir uh, shall I, shall i ask you to yeah i will stop sharing yeah, yeah, my screen yes sir sure sure uh, please share your screen sir yeah i need to share my screen yes sir you are mail id oh um, mesh i'll chat it I'll put it in the yes, chat sir. yes sir there is an option at the down uh, screen screen you know uh, at the screen uh, the uh, what i was uh, trying to do was sending it through chat only okay fine sir. Uh, maybe you. i can i think it's not going something is not right so i can send it to uh, uh, dr balu he yes sir yes okay. sir yes sir thank you thank you he will share for all participants now we have with us uh, uh, professor subhana rishi uh, for uh, uh, vote of thanks madam i, I welcome you and uh, uh, for the formal uh, vote of thanks thank you am i audible sir Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you are audible, ma'am. Continue. Okay. A very good afternoon to one and all. It gives it gives me an immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks for this webinar, organized by JFJC and PG Center Tintamani. Firstly, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to a resource person of this webinar, Dr. Rajesh Kumar T, for his inspirational thoughts and informative discussion. thank you very much sir it was a wonder, wonderful session the stakeholders of this webinar they have they have uh, much benefited over this thank you very much thank sir you. nextly i extend my sincere thanks to our principal ma'am dr k sharada for her keynote address and her uh, gradual support to support and encouragement with all our endeavors thank you ma'am next and most importantly i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the participants who are participated in this webinar from different parts of the country and they made this webinar grand successful thank you one and all and next i would like to thank the webinar convener dr mv balasubramanian Bal Bal sir for organizing this wonderful session thank you very much sir next i would like to extend my uh, heartfelt thanks to dr dinesh sir IQAC and NAC coordinator of our college for his keen support for this webinar. And lastly, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the teaching and non-teaching faculty of our college for their support. Thank you, one and all. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a nice day. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, madam, uh, for uh, formal uh, vote of thanks. Now, at valediction. Uh, i thank all participants and uh, iqac of the college faculty organizing advisory committee members and uh, I, i thank principal for uh, her constant support and uh, uh, i also request for all the participants uh, please take advantage of the uh, upcoming events which have been uh, hosted from our college for this uh, uh, continued uh, online activities thank you for one and all so uh, let's uh, close this session with these words so we are we are closing this session thank you Thank you very much. Huh? Yes, sir. Thank you.